Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now here's your host. Hey Steve, Melody, how are you guys? Great, Great. Mark, how are you this morning? Awesome. Hey, Thank I gotta you say, for us. Um, you guys did an amazing job at the Seattle Localization Users Group, the Slug meeting last night at the uh, Meta headquarters uh, in Bellevue. Great job. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. Um, thank you for the opportunity. It's great to have a forum where we can, um, you know, showcase what the 2023 trends are um, and also, you know, forecasts from a recruitment uh, perspective uh, for 2024 with everyone. Yeah, no, so thank you your uh, keynote presentation was, was was excellent. And then, you know, you, you, you moderated that panel discussion that I think was very informative. Um, the audience was... Um, very much engaged. What I, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the some of the you know things that you touched upon in your keynote address. For example, some of the the, the trends in terms of hiring these days in the local industry. Um, and what are you seeing in, in in terms of this last year? Um, in terms of what types of positions are in demand? Steve, I think you're probably best to answer that. Yeah. So I mean, um, you know, last year, 2022. You know, it was really all about sales recruitment. And um, this year, there's just been an influx of requests for operations positions. Um, so we've recruited about the same amount of positions from this year as we did last year. Um, but this year, it's really been a 50-50 split of sales and ops. I really think that boils down to our clients being focused on strengthening their current operations and their existing clients. Um, but yeah, worked on what worked on quite a few operations positions this year. Interesting, and I, I, I was going to you know drill down on that a bit. Um, besides, you know, your, your existing clients wanting to kind of strengthen their operations, is there any other kind of macro trends that are driving companies to say, hey, I mean, for example, well, instead of you know dip, um, building our sales team and growing organically, we want to grow go, grow through acquisition, or you know, so are there any other factors that are is kind of driving that trend? Yeah, definitely acquisition. Um, but for us on the recruitment side, working as partners, we're seeing um, a demand for subject matter experts. So last year it was more, we want a really good sales professional um, mm. or we want a really good marketing professional. Now it's more, um, actually we'd like someone that's more of a solutions architect potentially that has the tech uh, the technical understanding um and you know also is client facing so has the client facing skills or you know marketing we'd like someone that has a deep understanding of automation ai that's very forward thinking and can you know step change the business in 2024 and also steve i think so on the translation and operation side you have some examples well, I, I did notice uh, recently at the SlaterCon remote um, presentation where one of the presenters was talking about how, you know, like there are traditional, you know, QA positions and localization that are done by linguists. But then you can see now that you kind of showed a side by side comparison of another job description of a localization QA analyst. And there were a lot more tech requirements in that job that would have maybe traditionally be done by a linguist that would be qualified to do it, but now there's a lot more requirements based on all the different advancements that we're making with technology in the localization industry. That's interesting because I'm sure that this is a long-term trend in the industry that um, the industry is becoming more technical. Operations are becoming more technical. There's a lot more um, you know opportunities for automation um, and the uh, you know using different tools whether it's business reporting analytics um, translation management systems etc they were becoming kind of a, pretty much a must-have and as the company be, or the, the industry becomes more technical obviously you need the corresponding skill sets um and i'm wondering if we can extrapolate on that because I, it seems that the the adoption of technology continually kind of accelerates so that you know there's a lot of concerns right now in terms of the future outlook for jobs in the local industry. I, I wonder if we can extrapolate and say that, you know, if you want some job security, you better skill up on terms of the different times, uh, types of tools that are available. 
Yeah, definitely. In terms of um, examples, some of our best candidates are really, um, you know, self-educating, enrolling themselves on courses, uh, maybe out in terms of AI that's potentially outside the localization industry, as well as courses on prompt engineering. Um, you know, what's been great this year and very apparent is the Lion community have been kind of really focusing on pushing events, conferences, um, the attendees um, at Loke World. I mean, there was hundreds. It was amazing to kind of see all the keynote presentations. There was so many takeaways, SlaterCon, Gala. I just think we're kind of really lucky and fortunate to have um, so many events. And myself and Steve have really kind of learned a lot as well. I, I think you guys are like at every event that I've ever been to. <laughs> I'm just wondering, like, how many how many miles have you, uh, uh, you know, piled up in the last year, Melanie? <laughs> just... um, so many that I've lost count. Um, I mean, in between ALC, Loke World, and of course, some traveling in general um, around America. Um, I actually uh, was lucky enough to stop over at Seattle when it was sunny um, on my way to ALC. Um, and it's been amazing. Um, you know, we are also thinking of attending Latin America, um, Juntos next year. Oh, yeah. and, and obviously it's great to see that there's um, going to be some European uh, conferences as well next year. So yeah, it's been really fun meeting people from all across the world. Well, I want to come back to the conferences in a second. If we go back to the, um, you know, the importance of, you know, skilling up and the opportunities for self-education, do you find that prospective employees are asking for certain credentials or do they just want some type of proof that, hey, this person is self-motivated and they're going out there and kind of educating themselves? Steve? I mean, I think um, companies are definitely looking for the credentials or they're looking for those key words on LinkedIn pages and resumes to be able to quickly identify people that already have the, the technical requirements that they're looking for. Um, but I don't, I don't know that they're necessarily expecting people to go out and do the professional development ahead of time. But when I think about the conversations that I have with candidates that are maybe in a Gen Z or a younger generation, what they're looking for is hoping that these prospective employers will offer, you know, professional development opportunities or learning and development that they can do on the job and train up or skill up while they're in, in a role um, at the same time. And with sales, I mean, drive and, you know, the soft skills um, is on that growth mindset. I mean, growth mindset is, is definitely important across the board, but, you know, sales, the drive rather than necessarily the qualifications, every meeting. Yeah, okay. Says okay. And I 100% agree. And I've spent most of my, my career on the sales business development side, even when I was in the, you know, a, an executive role, say head of Asia Pacific, my heart was mostly on the sales and growing the business side of, of things. Um, and I gotta say, interviewing salespeople is tricky because they're salespeople. And so how, how do you as a recruiter evaluate whether that drive and that kind of um, growth mentality is real or not? Yeah, so um, the benefit of us being kind of external um, recruiters as opposed to the candidates um, interviewing directly with um, our company is we build um, good rapport with the candidates and they're really honest with us. Um, so, you know, because we don't want to um, waste anyone's time in terms of candidates and clients. So we will ask them, you know, what drives you? Um, you know, a lot of the time is, um, you know, growth, career growth, but also questions that we're getting asked now is what's the tech stack of the company? Um, what are the differentiators? Um, what are the plans? What, what does the leadership look like? Who am I going to be working for? So these questions are really encouraging. Um, it, it's the why, as Simon Sinek says, you know, why, why do you want to work in sales? Why localization? Um, what's your passion? Um, what motivates you? 
Um, and if they can give you really well thought, um, articulate answers and, and talk about their sales processes and some uh, difficult wins and really talk you through the process, then that shows that they're really passionate and, you know, they're, they're thinking really about their career. Yeah, yeah makes a lot of sense. Um, let me ask you, kind of flip it a second. Uh, if you're an organization and you want to recruit more high caliber candidates, what advice would you give to, uh, to, to, to organizations out there to do that? Okay, so there's two parts. One is talent attraction, and then the other one is talent acquisition. So first of all, talent attraction is you need to see your company in, in the way that you want to attract clients. Candidates are equally, if not more important. Um, so the branding, it obviously starts with that. You want to showcase the culture. So one of our clients does this exceptionally well. On the careers side of their website, they'll give bios into kind of key uh, people in the leadership team. Um, in terms of um, hiring, you know, with any strategy um, in any function, um, you need to be very clear as a leadership team um, what is the solution that you're looking to solve with who you're recruiting. So, for example, what we saw a lot of last year with um, some clients was we need to bring in sales, so we need salespeople. And, and that really was the strategy. Okay, they've got sales experience. Um, but this year it's okay, but what will they be selling? Who will they be targeting? What verticals? And sort of thinking about that first. Um, what has worked? What hasn't worked? What skills are we looking for? So skills-based hiring is more important than just looking at the experience. And then really, so my background, when I worked with Steve in Chicago, I was global head of talent for a company of 600 employees. So what worked really well for us was designing um, an interview process um, to see how we would measure those skills. So each um, hiring manager would have a set of questions, nothing too complex, um, and kind of, and that would um, create a feedback system. Um, so that when they made a decision, all the hiring team were aligned, all that information was there. So in terms of, you know, attracting the high caliber candidates, if the high caliber candidates kind of see good branding, a great culture, all the hiring team are aligned, time scales um, are stuck to. So expectations are set from the start. Um, you know, in terms of, we all know time kills interest when you're trying to attract a client. It's the same thing with a candidate. Time and time again, we get a great candidate. The candidate's really excited, but you know, the client's busy. It, it, you know, we've got the holidays coming up, January. And unfortunately, these candidates are interviewing elsewhere. And you know, the candidate wants to feel special, right? But then, you know, of course the client wants to feel special, you know, in terms of, you know, passion from the candidate as well. So that that's kind of a, a really um, important thing, kind of planning at the start. Um, and communication throughout as well. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. I, I One of the, I guess, most pleasant experiences that I had uh, in terms of being recruited was when they, the recruiter who introduced me to the firm, and this was a, an LSP that was doing about 100 million a year. So, you know, mid-size, pretty good size company. Um, the recruiter really sold me on the position, sold me on the future of the company, the tech stack. They're, they're developing this amazing technology. My first meeting with the company was with the CEO and the CTO made me feel special. He arranged um, meetings with the other top executives. And I, I mean, I, I felt like, God, man, you know, I'm like really something cool here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and, and it just made me want to work with yeah. them. But then it went beyond that when I, uh, and I, I, and I wasn't in the market. In fact, I pushed back on the recruiter probably like three or four calls. And it, 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 it like, he, he was like, Mark, just, you got to talk to him. He's, you know, he's going to be, he's going to be in Tokyo. Just meet with the CEO. You got to meet, you know? So it was like, I got, I got that feeling. But then when I accepted the position, the onboarding was equally as impressive. They took it very seriously. 
Um, they positioned me as, you know, a regional leader and they gave me access to all the key people in the organization so that, you know, I felt like I was part of the team. And, you know, I can contrast that with the things that you're talking about where, yeah, we were interested, but then, oh, well, this person's not in town right now and we can't, mm -hmm. we'll try to set up a meeting. And I'm like, whatever, man. Yeah. obviously you don't care about me. Probably mm -hmm. sometimes you get the feeling that maybe they have somebody else yes. in mind, but they have a, right. a rule that they have got to interview at least three people. And I'm one of the three odd persons out just to kind of, you know, tick the box or something. And that is completely uh, correct. Um, you know, we always advise um, recruit the right person, not the best person at the time. So you might interview 10 people, but if then they don't meet that initial strategy, you know, to solve that um, problem that you had at the start, then, you know, with, especially with executive search, a lot of the positions that we recruit for are key strategic positions. It can take, you know, we always say an average of 12 weeks from, you know, getting the job in, putting the sourcing strategy together, conducting screening calls, first stage, second stage. In your case, you're maybe flying that executive in uh, for an in-person interview. Um, you know, 12 weeks really is is the average. And the, our best clients are the ones that have a key um, like a hiring plan that's kind of very organized at the start of the year for 12 months that's in line with the business goals. Um, and then they are recruiting ahead of time. And with key positions where there's a shortage of, you know, A-class candidates, sometimes it's about just keeping the hopper open. So, mm -hmm. you know, even if you're not looking until Q6, one of our you know, key success stories was an enterprise uh, client um, last year. You know, this this person that my client needed five enterprise sales candidates within you know next month January, and I was like, cool. You know, we'll we'll definitely you know do do our best, and and you know we did find um, some great candidates. But the key question I asked was, but what's your goal for the rest of the year? You know leadership positions tell me more about that and he said well actually i'm looking for a vp sales but that's going to be in june and i said you know what i've got someone perfect who's not going to be on the market in six months why don't you just have an intro call and in the end they you know they hired that person that's that's awesome um let me ask you this how do you um how do you handle the conversation between your um, the recruits uh, or prospective hires, and then the um, your customers, the hiring companies. If there's a big gap in terms of salary, bonus structure, expectations, how do you how do you manage that? Yeah, so setting expectations at the start is absolutely key. Um, we, we have had some situations there, um, so. You know, the, our first kind of initial five, 10 minutes, we'll be asking the candidate, you know, we're not going to say, what, right, what, what's the salary that, that you want for a job? Uh, and that's it, because they don't know what the job is, is the commission plan and so on. But what is the very minimum? Okay. And then when we're taking in the job with the client, you know, what experience level, salary and so on, you know, I, this might sound cheesy, but I always say it's kind of shopping for uh, real estate as well, looking for a candidate, you know, if they both have a budget in mind and our role is to mm -hmm. kind of manage that negotiation. So it's all, all we always are very clear with candidates and clients. Um, let's be clear on expectations at the start. So when we set, submit the resume, um, you know, once the candidate is selected, we know what the role is. Um, we'll, you know, speak to the candidate and we'll say, this is the role. Now you know what the role is. What salary is it that you're looking for? you know, including bonuses. And then we communicate that with the client. That communication is up front before the first stage interview so that everyone knows. And, and so then at the end, there should be no surprises at offer stage unless the role has changed significantly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I did have a candidate that kind of moved move goalposts and, you know, the client offered at the start what we do all agreed. And, you know, this candidate just kind of changed their mind. And, and I kind of said, look, you can't do that. And I was quite straightforward. You're going to talk yourself out of a job here because, you know, we've agreed everything The, you know, we, we will a assist really in negotiation. Bad way to start. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Yeah. 
we'll, we'll assist and, you know, and negotiate and help, help clients, you know, uh, meet their budgets. We also had a client that, you know, at the start, they said, right, this is our budget. We know we're looking for an A player on, you know, a junior budget. And we were quite upfront when we were having our initial call and we said, you know what, if you want this A player candidate, we suggest that you open the talent pool into emerging markets as well. And it was one of our key success stories this year. Um, we suggested recruiting also in Latin America, opening up the search there. And they secured an excellent production leader, an account manager and a sales professional. Um, and we had a great testimonial. But it, it, so it, it's funny because that was like the next question on my list was, you know, offshoring some of these mm -hmm. key positions. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that because especially when you're talking about sales at a higher level, it, you know, the world used to be the, the, the person would have to be in the region or at least be able to visit the region on a regular basis. I think post COVID people are open to mo much more to, you know, doing business remotely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I guess things are starting to switch back a bit. But, you know, what are you seeing? What what types of positions and what levels of positions can be offshored? Yeah, Steve? I think for offshoring into, you know, just different countries that operations seems to make the most sense. Um, I think one challenge that you could run into potentially with, or at least that I've seen when we're discussing sales candidates is they need to understand the market that they're selling into. They need to be able to speak the language that they're selling into fluently um, because mm -hmm. they're client facing. So that might present some different challenges um, with offshoring, but from an operational standpoint, you can find really big hubs like Argentina, for example, where there are so many um, great operations professionals in the localization industry there that you could tap into that um, for, you know, a uh, lesser of a budget or, less expensive than you would necessarily in the United States or other places. And I, I guess with Argentina, yeah. if it's coming into North America, time zone's not such a big difference, but um, is that an issue in some other offshore locations? So yeah, that's what I was um, going to kind of bring more of a perspective from the European side. Um, so Eastern Europe is also a great hub. Um, we've got uh, places like Egypt, um, Israel, we just recruited uh, a professional from Algeria for uh, one of our clients. Um, when I first started out this company three years ago, um, I'd never recruited in Budapest, but I mean, it's it's really the same thing. It's, it's online. Um, we're a world without borders now. Um, so yeah, and that's really where we come in um, from a consulting point of view, not just kind of recruitment. Um, and, you know, we do have a report, um, you know, coming out published next week that um, has a lot, provides a lot of kind of salary information, um, which can assist and it's, it's regionally uh, focused as well, which can assist uh, clients when they're looking at different markets, what the salaries are and so on. Um, what's great is um, candidates that truly love working in this industry, they're open, you know, they, they will work mm -hmm. different time zones to suit. I have candidates in Europe um, that want to work, you know, in the USA, they're happy to work US time zones. So, you know, even with Latin America being closer to the US, there are other options as well. One of the things about offshoring uh, is, is also that potentially sometimes organizations feel a lack of control. One, that maybe they don't have a legal entity in the market where they'll be doing the hiring. So they have to put the person on a contract basis. Uh, they're not on their physical premise. So there's potential security concerns, things like that. Um, are, are these concerns or, and, and if so, how are, how are companies addressing them? Yeah, well, I, I can speak um, about my company. Um, so uh, as an example, <laughs> so, um, you know, as an example, uh, you know, for three years, we've had, had a team um, of an excellent team based in India. Obviously, we've got Steve also in the US. And how we overcome that, there are um, different solutions. So you have um, companies where you can use an agency that have kind of staff that, you know, if you can uh, trial a, a candidate uh, maybe for a week, and um, they report in on a contract 
rather than a contractor um, to your company. They are on a, a working contract, um, you know, and, and, and that's a way that we've used. Um, also, something that uh, came up um, at the ALC and what we use here is a company called Deal. So essentially, they're not a contractor. They are, um, they, that company acts as an employer on record. So, uh, for example, Steve gets all the health care, the benefits. He has an employment contract, um, but we don't have a legal entity in the U.S. So this company, it's seamless. It takes a couple of days to kind of set up. That, that's that's fascinating. So Deal actually hires you and then um, and then you, and then you, the, the, the hiring company would actually do a contract with Deal. OK, mm -hmm. and so Deal would send you an invoice yep. um, and send Steve a W-2, for example. I don't know what the real situation is, but but does that make sense? Is that yep. was that what you're describing? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Since Melanie and I work in separate countries, uh, we do really well with just communicating mm -hmm. um, throughout the day. Um, obviously lots of emails are just hopping on a quick call, but you know, there are, are also some challenges, right? You know, like, uh, when we're together in the same location on travel and we have time to collaborate together in the same room, we get a lot of great stuff done. And, you know, sometimes I think that is you know, a missing element when you're working, you know, away from each other, um, a lot of the time. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. I actually like not having to go into the office. But you can be super productive sometimes because you can just go over and say, hey, I was thinking about this or, hey, look, can we have a quick chat as opposed to scheduling a time and, you know, and trying to sync schedules and everything like that. I'm sorry, I cut you off, Melanie. Go ahead. No, no. But luckily, get Steve actually started his onboarding in uh, uh, Wales and then Dublin for Gala. Yes. So it was quite the experience. So Steve definitely gets, uh, I, and I guess that's opportunities that necessarily you wouldn't get where myself and Steve worked at a company previously in downtown Chicago, um, commuting to the office, polar vortex or not, um, which is an experience. <laughs> um, and that is great, full collaboration, but also when we're doing kind of the, the deep work where we just need to be completely focused, there's nothing better than, than kind of, you know, working kind of on your own and then kind of regrouping. Um, you know, something that works really well in our organization is clear plans. So, um, you know, we have a process um, where, you know, plans are submitted at the end. We have an end of the day report, um, a day plan, which can change. Um, you know, obviously Steve has lots of emails when he starts at 8 a.m. because <laughs> I've been online for about five hours. <laughs> yep. Hey, Definitely welcome to my can't, world. Can't uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, Memo Q's in Budapest, right? So uh, the time yeah. I come on, you know, I I start my day typically at six or seven a.m. my time because I'm on the West Coast. Yeah. And uh, yeah, all the emails are there. And they're like, why hasn't he responded? <laughs> it's like, he's out of the sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Let's go, let's go back to the uh, geo arbitrage uh, offshoring kind of mm -hmm. uh, question situation for a second. You know, it's funny because I, uh, with the MemoQ RFP, the, 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 the SaaS startup that I'm running, um, one of the issues is finding affordable development uh, talent. And it used to be, well, you could just offshore, you know, in Central Western Europe or excuse me, Eastern Europe was a, a prime location. But what's happened is there's a, there's a global shortage of development uh, talent. And, and so you got a guy in Budapest or a gal, and he's like, I'm working remote anyway. Everybody's working remote doing this stuff. So why should I work for any less just because? And so the, there's a, almost a parody. Now, there's some extreme examples like if, you know, Silicon Valley, for example, just because the cost of living is so darn high there. And if you want somebody on site, but for anybody who's working remote, there's kind of almost a global parity right now. And I'm wondering in, in the localization industry, are you seeing any movement in that direction where the delta is kind of shrinking? We're actually seeing um, a lot of different things happening um, from company to company, candidate to candidate. So we had a company last year that really believed that regardless of your location, you should be paid equally. So you know, which was great for candidates um, over in Europe, uh, working for US companies that had teams in the US. And that was a real pull. Um, they really had the pick of the talent pool. Um, my, our candidates felt really valued. And, you know, that, that, was, that was great. Um, 
In terms of Latin America, we are seeing that because there is a demand from uh, companies in the US and Europe um, recruiting in Latin America, it is naturally supply and demand um, driving up salaries, which is great for candidates. It's you know not a situation where there's parity between uh, US salaries and salaries in Latin America, but there is a lot of change that's happened this year um, as a result of things being a bit more competitive in emerging markets. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, so there's still some some pretty good opportunities to to offshore some some key positions. No, hundred percent, and we're actually seeing um, a lot of new markets that um, typically we um, wouldn't have recruited in. So, for example, we have um, clients in Brazil, and they're expanding the talent pool into Portugal. Different time zone, wow. same language. Um, so yeah, that's that's a trend that we've seen this year. Interesting. Okay, let me ask you guys to put your sales hats on here for a second, okay? okay? And um, I'm a I'm an LSP or I'm a you know a, a, on the buy side for local services, and I want to recruit some key positions. And I'm saying like, you know what? Why would I pay whatever the fees are when I can just put ads in you know key industry magazines, websites, uh, etc., leverage our network, and I know we can get some people. In fact, we put an ad out last week and we got 145 different resumes or, or job or people applied. Why would I, why would I use a, you know, an executive recruiter? Great. Um, so I'm actually making notes. I feel like I'm in a client meeting ready to pitch. Um, so... <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I could be a client one day. You never know. <laughs> um, so a couple of key things there is you pay, I mean, ourselves anyway we're on a contingency basis rather than a re we're not retained search um which means you pay on results which can be a lot more cost effective than having an internal recruitment team however the model that works really well is having an internal recruitment team they understand your culture you know there's a lot more kind of candid conversations internally with hiring managers everyone's aligned strategically but also partnering with an external headhunting firm that is a specialist in the industry. We're at all the events and particularly we are uh, meeting clients, looking to the white of eyes of companies, candidates, getting a feel um, of their personalities, culture fit. Um, and then in terms of, um, in terms of looking at budgets, in turn, you could pay a recruiter but you might not get the results. So this, the base salary that you're paying, maybe I know when we were in recruitment in Chicago, you know, the average salary of a recruiter is 100K. So, you know, then a fee um, for a hire then kind of looks, you know, typically you can make five hires with an external recruiter, um, but on a, a base salary, um, pot potentially um, uh, that recruiter internally may not make five hires. So looking at it that way, um, and also applications, they can definitely work. Um, we tend to find they're more effective with entry level positions. Um, a lot of A-class candidates, they're not looking, they're enjoying right. their job. Um, they're looked after really well by their employers. But, you know, the, the benefits of using a headhunter is we have those long-term relationships and you know the can a lot of the time, especially in in markets where things are changing, um, you know candidates always want to be kept in the loop. And you know if there is an opportunity that is um, more interesting, they're always open to listening. And 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 we're also effectively introducers rather than so we'll set up conversations rather than. Um, you know, just like, right, here's the job, you need to be kind of seriously interested. Um, and that tends to work really well. That makes a lot of sense. I, um, so it's funny, because I, I've run some different businesses, you know, and, and I, if I have, I guess, a, a fault, it's the fact that I, I really try to control spending. And I always look for ways to do things in a more affordable way, which oftentimes works but sometimes um, just leads to, to needless amounts of extra work. 
And I remember recruiting um, some positions and, and actually getting, you know, a hundred resumes and thinking like, oh, look at all this. And then the effort it took, even though the, I wasn't personally going through the first round, but to go through them, because somebody has got to go mm -hmm. through them. And, and if we don't have a recruiter, it was, um, well, the sales managers are going to go through it and they're going to do a short list and then they're going to interview and then I'm going to interview. And if we don't find somebody, all of that effort. Yeah. And like you said, a lot of times the best people aren't actually in the market. They're not sending their resumes yeah. out. There's a reason that these people are sending their resumes out. It's because maybe they don't have a job or they're not happy in the job. And if they're in a sales role, why aren't they happy in the job? Maybe because they're getting too much pressure. They're not performing. I don't know. I mean, there's a variety of reasons. I also have to say that um, I, when I learned, after I learned that lesson, I had no problem signing off on yeah. the, uh, the contingency fees. It was like the best thing ever because the best hires that I've ever made have been from one of three situations in internal promotion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because then you know what the person, their, their attitude, their aptitude, their skill sets, all that stuff. Um, you know, you've worked with them or, or the other people in the organization have, or it's somebody that I've worked with in the past who I've brought into. So for example, I have a couple of former colleagues that, um, I was able to, to convince to join us at MemoQ, right? And they've, they've done a tremendous job. You guys know who you are if you're listening. Um, and they made me look good. They made me look like I, that, that I could be a recruiter. <laughs> but the, the third source has been recruiters. And for me, it was really important to, um, to work with a recruiter. They get to know kind of what I'm looking for or what our organization is looking for. Um, and then you, you develop this trust because if they, they place people, in fact, one of the people that I just um, brought to MemoQ about a year ago, we worked together in uh, Singapore. She was introduced from a recruitment company. It's, uh, I guess, a lesson that some some people need to learn. But for me, if you're working with, with the right recruiters, I don't have my sales hat on. I'm just speaking to you know how I feel here. Um, you guys bring a, a tremendous amount of value to the table. I think what you've said there, just to kind of tie it all in, is you need to work with an external recruitment partner that really understands you and take an interest. Um, I always say to clients, because I am quite um, involved in recruiting for our clients, even though I am also the business owner, is when you're dealing with a business owner that is actively interested in the growth of your company, um, you, we, we kind of have a one in three uh, conversion rate. We really make sure that if the candidate with the, the candidate we're sending we're fairly confident that they will receive a job offer because as a business owner, it's really important. You know, the reputation of my company in the industry is, is so important. And sure, we've maybe missed out on filling a couple of positions because we didn't feel comfortable putting a B player in front of our client because it really is about a long-term right. goal. And, and as you mentioned, um, internal recruiters, the benefit is they understand the culture of the company, but you can also get that through selecting the right recruitment partner as well. Excellent. Makes a lot of sense. Steve, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I think uh, to piggyback on that, I think, um, you know, really understanding the client and getting, having those opportunities to meet them also in person. So you understand their culture, their personality, um, and it really helps when you're identifying a culture fit for the company. Um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've spoken with a candidate and I put the phone down and I'm just like, that person would love to, to speak with XYZ client. And they, they, they connect and it just works out really well. So to, to kind of add to Melanie's point, I think just understanding the client, forming a real partnership um, with that client is paramount. That's I totally agree with you. And it's funny because one of the best executive recruiters that I've ever worked with, um, had, you know, he, he was also really good at giving me personal advice or career advice. And I was in Singapore and in Singapore, it's, you know, it's a finance center and you have these people working at Credit Suisse, UBS, and these, these great large banks and AB and AMRO and, and they've got that banking lifestyle. And, and, and I, and I said to him, I said, Hey guy, um, you know, I'm, I'm working at CEO Asia Pacific. How could I transition into, um, you know, one of these large banks? And he said, Mark, don't even think about it. Yeah. yeah. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I know your personality. You're entrepreneurial. You like autonomy. You don't like politics. You would die. Yeah. Okay. You would go into one of these large organizations 
and you would you would have to play so many jump through so many different hoops now would you make more money possibly you know but at the end of the day you'd be knocking on my door in eight months saying hey help me out of, get out of here right <laughs> and it was cool that you know he 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 understood me but he also understood yeah. the culture of that industry and that's i think super important and that's kind of when we're speaking with sales candidates it's a similar conversation um you know one of the first questions when we're getting to know a candidate is what kind of role are you looking for um do you love new business sales do you love winning accounts you know hustling to really you know win a deal and working hard thinking creatively or do you prefer you know more account management building relationships you know qbrs you know thinking strategically looking at uh, different opportunities um and candidates are really honest with us you know you know, I, I won't quote too many, sometimes too honest, um, but you know, if a candidate is not, you know, sometimes candidates say, well, sales pays more money. And we're like, okay, that's not necessarily the right reason to get into sales. Um, mm. it, it's more, you got to love, you know, I mean, myself and Steve have worked in sales or sales recruitment most of our lives, obviously apart excluding the Navy when, and Steve served for, served for there. But yeah, you, you've got to love, sales to work in it and I, and I guess it's really any position you've got to really enjoy you know you spend so much time um you know at work what's great about the loke industry is people are so passionate i mean like most people are so passionate about languages localization and it's across the board it's not just in sales the passion is there in, in across the board totally um just gonna ask you a few more questions here First off, uh, you know, you, you, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, how you communicate and, and, and work with your, your clients or customers. I, I'm sure that, you know, for example, at events last night, you may get, get people who are looking for new positions or candidates would come and approach you. And I, I, explain to me that dynamic, like, I mean, how do you manage that? Do you ever um, meet a candidate and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go to bat for this person, not because I, I already know a position, but because but I, but I think they're extremely hireable. Yeah. I think, Steve, you're very good at this. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I definitely um, try, especially if somebody makes a really good impression um, on that, that first call. And I think they have a lot of great experience and skill sets. One thing I like to do is is market that client out to our existing client base or since we have such a vast network um i'll do a, i mean i'm sure you've probably seen <laughs> at least once a week um a candidate of the week posts where i can highlight somebody's experience without obviously putting all of their personally identifiable information there so that way it's anonymous but if somebody really makes a good impression on me I will definitely go out of my way to market them to the client base, to pr prospective clients that I might be trying to work with, and then share them out to my existing network on LinkedIn to, you know, just put my best foot forward to see if I can conjure up some interest in that candidate, especially if I think they're going to make a big impact on one of my clients. That's awesome. So any candidates that are out there listening, um, you know, it's important to make a really good impression and, and you know, go for it. Um, let me ask, I, I, I think I'm down to like three, three questions now. Have you, what happens if you, if you place somebody and like a month later or two months, three months, it's, it's just not working out. Yeah. How do you deal with those situations? Does it ever happen? One. And if so, how do you deal with it? Well, okay. any recruiter that tells you it never happens is <laughs> definitely not telling the truth. Um, <laughs> so our statistic last year, um, you know, it's an executive search, so we're not, you know, a volume based recruitment firm, but 94% of the hires uh, remained in the position. And I think that's due to a cu couple of factors, and I will definitely come back to your question, um, is, you know, companies aren't going to pay uh, a headhunting fee unless they've really made sure um, to their best ability that, you know, this candidate's going to work out. Uh, Senior positions um, tend to be kind of a higher retention because, you know, um, these candidates are carefully considering their next move. They're asking the right questions, um, doing their due diligence. But from time to time, um, 
sometimes it doesn't work out. Most of the time it's due to culture fit. So um, it, it, the candidate maybe um, just, just doesn't quite kind of gel, synergize. Um, sometimes we'll advise uh, clients at the start for your budget, um, what you're looking for, this candidate's not not the right level. Um, we would suggest paying the extra 20K on the base salary um, to get someone, the ROI on that 20K base could be half a million in revenue. Um, now, sometimes clients just don't have that budget, roll the dice, and unfortunately, it won't work out. But what we do is, you know, there have been maybe three um, occasions this year. We will kind of recalibrate with the client, have a meeting. We do have a, um, you know, a guarantee period where if the candidate doesn't work out, we will work on, you know, providing a replacement. But we will reset together and, and kind of look at what didn't work out. And we'll make sure that we um, assess the candidate against maybe a new criteria or a new package or what uh, Steve's actually worked in sales um, in the language industry. And, and maybe you can kind of comment on a couple of conversations you've had recently with clients. Yeah, well, yeah, I think we could just um, just talking to the client about, you know, what exactly they're looking for in terms of activity, um, you know, what what level um, of sales professional are they are they looking for? Are they able to really um, intelligently speak about the verticals that they're they're selling into? Or intelligently speak about the localization industry? Maybe they need more experience than what she originally um, had had requested in our, our our first brief. So I think it's just dialing in on exactly what the the client is looking for. Maybe just recalibrating and refocusing the search. And, and also um, looking at what support the candidate will have. So we'll we'll ask these questions in the initial kind of when, you know, discovery call. Um, do you, are there any leads in the database? What kind of marketing support, um, you know, does the company, are they kind of starting I mean, from if, zero? If I was a sales candidate, that would be one of my pr pr first questions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're like, we want you to go out and grow the business. All right. So how? And, you know, are we, are you want me just to go out and knock on doors or is there going to be, is there going to be a regular uh, flow of leads and what kind of leads and how, because for me, that's super important. The world we live in right now, I mean, I think going to drive a lot of it, in my opinion. And also um, really looking at the business plan. And, you know, I think when I was junior in sales, I certainly wasn't asking these questions, but we always advise candidates of any level to kind of ask the client, what is the revenue quota that you're going to hold me accountable to? Um, we had a client recently, um, you know, the revenue quota was 600K, but they wanted a candidate with one year's experience. And sure, they, they had some leads in the database, but this candidate is going to take a lot more kind of training and onboarding and, you know, the, the, sure. the ramp up time to, you know, sign up a client so we had to have a candid a candid conversation with this client and and kind of maybe set more realistic expectations if you want a 600k uh you know delivering a candidate we're probably going to have to look at someone with that already has an existing book of business um or you know contacts or you know you're going to need to maybe push back the hiring date until you have everything in place in terms of marketing maybe some events and you know for, for them to attend first yeah i mean it's something sometimes when you're hiring a salesperson it's almost like you're you're buying a business because if they bring yes. their book of business with them you know what i mean and so you have to invest in it it's a uh, yeah um let me switch, switch switch it up here a bit Tell me a success story, something uh, with the customer experience that uh, that has gone extremely well for you. How did it start yeah. and how did it progress? Yeah, sure. Um, so I recently um, had a client that we're working with, a language service provider, um, focusing solely on the, the federal government. Um, and they partnered with us because they were putting together a bid for a program that they wanted to win and they needed 
three senior level operations uh, localization professionals to you know, lead that program, but identify the candidates to submit with the proposal. So we work with them um, to identify all of the candidates that they needed. Uh, they selected them, and when they submitted that proposal, they were they were awarded a very major contract with the federal government, which will grow their company quite a bit. Awesome, man! That's great. It's got to feel good. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was yeah. a big one. Yeah, that, that's that's great. Well, um, earlier you mentioned that um, you've just published or about to publish some some research. Um, maybe you could explain or you know talk a little bit about that and maybe point out one or two, three of the key findings, and then let us know how we can get a hold of the report. Yeah, so this started out originally. Um, it was due to be published in October as really a salary document, salary kind of breakdown by country, by role. Um, and then we started doing some kind of deeper uh, research and because the market's really uh, changing, um, evolving with um, trends that we've discussed today, we thought, you know what, we need to provide more insights around this data. So we kind of pushed it back slightly. Um, and then Loquilt, um, so much information kind of fed into that. Um, so in terms of insights that we've covered, sure, you know, salaries are, are definitely a key component but also AI um, and how that has kind of affected, um, you know, the market, the roles that, that clients are now looking for, new roles that, you know, we didn't even know, um, you know, existed, mm. they're, they're newly created positions. Um, we've also uh, segmented the industry into language services and language technology because there's been a lot of movement there as well. Um, also Gen Z, um, you know, there was obviously a, a comment made at a, a slug event last night that, you know, there's um, not a lot of presence of Gen Z at a lot of the knowledge sharing events. And so what we wanted to do, um, we have interviewed a number of Gen Z uh, candidates and really got their perspective as well. And it's really interesting what they value um, compared to maybe di other generations um, can you can you give an example? Yeah, Steve, I'm curious because I've got a couple Gen Zs uh, in my family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm still trying to figure it out, man. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, and I'm maybe showing my age a little bit here, and I know there's different schools of thought on this topic, but you know, I think traditionally, <laughs> oh, I, you know, I'm already <laughs> <laughs> an, an employer, you know, wants to hear from the candidate, like, what are you bringing to the table for my company? What are you going to do to be successful in this position? But you know, looking at Gen Z or a younger generation, you know, they need to be, they, they want to be sold on why they should be working for, you know, your company um, or what are some of the learning and development opportunities that I'll have while I'm working in this position to continue to skill up while I'm working for your organization. Um, Work-life balance is extremely important. Um, I you know, get questions during screening calls now with candidates asking about what's the turnover like over there or, you know, how's retention, you know, because stability um, is, is very important. You know, you look over the last year, there's been some, not not all, but some, you know, layoffs. So people want to know that they're going to be joining a company and have an opportunity that's going to last long term. Yeah, and I think those are all legitimate questions, um, and not just for Gen Z people. I think those are legit questions for uh, anybody, regardless of what your generation is, but yeah. probably greater priority for uh, for that younger generation. And also, um, I think salaries is so important. Um, there was actually a, I don't know if anyone listening has seen this uh, TikTok, it went viral. Um, it was a, a Gen Z um a girl um from america and she was quite real she sort of said look the you know cost of living has increased by x percent but salaries have only you know increased by y percent so what is the motivation for us to work 40 to 60 hours and you know there's a term greenwashing that's kind of you, you know now kind of thrown around where you know, they they are not kind of attracted to 
um, all the kind of intangible kind of um, benefits. It's more, you know, tell me what the job is, you know, is, is the, are the expectations realistic and the salary must be realistic. And really that is the struggle for ourselves as external recruiters, because we really do have a deep understanding of, um, you know, the salaries and they're not set each year either. Um, so, you know, I always urge um, anyone, whether you're a client of ours or you're, you know, you're recruiting through other means to really do your research, um, yeah. you know, into salary, um, but also um, all the other, um, you know, things that, that candidates are looking for as well. So you very, you know, quickly secure the right person. Awesome. Well, um, to that end, I'm assuming that we can put a, a link to the report in the show notes uh, for this episode. We'll be publishing it probably about a week from now. I, um, yeah. I guess the report will be ready by then. Yeah, definitely. The report will be ready by then. Um, so there is a link. It's free. Um, so yeah, click the link and you'll be able to download it. And um, we would welcome any feedback. Um, this is a working document, so it's it's not just pu going to be published once a year. Um, if you have feedback, you know, the market's changing um, quite rapidly. Um, so, you know, it is something if, if you wish to have more information, reach out to us and, you know, we can see about putting something uh, together maybe next year um, at the end of Q1, Q2 um, that might be uh, of assistance. Awesome. And I do have one last request. Okay. <laughs> okay. He should teach me how to say something in Welsh. Okay. Here is one. <laughs> and I then then you could laugh at my pronunciation, but go ahead. I'm gonna give it a, I'm gonna give it my best effort. I am going to give you a million dollars if you can pronounce <laughs> this word the first time. It is the longest Welsh word and it is 52 letters and it's okay, the name forget about it. I could I, I just <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead and say go ahead and say the word I want to see if you can pronounce it yeah I had one but the wheel fell off <laughs> so... <laughs> So, what does it mean? It's the name of a very small village in Wales, and it just describes... So funny. It's a small village with a huge name. A okay. little overcompensation there. Okay. <laughs> We'd love to see the signage for that. Look it up. Right? The sign is bigger than the town, man. <laughs> so there's a train station, and you stop. The, and it's you, see, you certainly know where you are, that's for sure. You can't miss the sign. That's hilarious. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, hey, Melanie, um, Steve, thank you so much for coming out to the Slug event. And also thank you for being on MemoQ Talks. I um, I look forward to, to cross the pass with you guys again, hopefully soon. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for having us, Mark. Thank you for joining MemoQ Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on MemoQ Talks. 